Before we get started on this video, this episode of Bricky Brings You Content is brought to you by my sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club delivering a box of all kinds of various items from top shelf and under the radar brands. It's completely free to join. And every month they introduce their members to cool different products, things like outdoor gear, barware, kitchen goods, clothing, and even more. All of this entirely based on a preference quiz that you fill out when signing up. The lineup changes every month, but each box of awesome has around $70 in value, but you only pay a fraction of the price. In fact, 90% of the products in Bespoke Post come from small brands, many of which are right here in the US. And what should be made clear is that while you can sign up and take the quiz, you don't owe any money until you decide to pick a box. You only pay for what you want. And before it gets shipped to you, you can even decide if you want to keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for absolutely no charge. Throughout this ad, you've seen me unboxing three of the boxes I chose. The three I specifically went with were the Concentrate, Explore, and Wabi Sabi boxes. Concentrate because I have a crippling caffeine addiction and anything a new coffee sounds lovely to me. Explore because despite the fact that I am in a busy suburban SoCal, we do have plenty of different fun trails and hiking areas you can go through. And Wabi Sabi because sushi is my favorite food of all time. That is uh, one of the more Californian things I can say, but hey, I know who I am. I will certainly be using the things I got from these three boxes. And if you would like to get your first ever box of awesome, and not only that, but get it for 20% off, click the link in the description and enter code BRICKY20 at checkout, or go to bespokepost.com slash BRICKY20. Thanks again to Bespoke Post for sponsoring this video. Head on over to the link in the description to get 20% off your first box with code BRICKY20. Hello, everybody. My name is Bricky. Currently, well, feeling a little whelmed, not, not overwhelmed or underwhelmed, but just whelmed. I stand here in front of the green screen I, I painted on my closet wall, thinking to myself, this is certainly one of the days of all time. $70, $70, it's a lot of money. It's also like not a lot of money. I recall a conversation I had with a friend on the discussion of the $100 bill and how it is simultaneously a lot of money and almost no money. $100 is a decent amount of groceries, uh, a nice dinner date for you and someone special, a refilling a lot of cleaning supplies around the house, or even a lot of essential bits of clothing, like simple name brand underwear, socks, t-shirts. You can get a lot for $100, but it's also not even a month's worth of electricity, a fraction of rent, and just barely covering a full tank of gas in 2023. And over the past five years, even the $100 that meant a lot feels like it's meaning less and less with rising inflation, poor wages, and a housing market that is at best infuriating and at worst unfixable. Along with the price of basically everything else, video games are also increasing in cost, going from the $60 they have been for over a decade to $70 for the quote, triple A game. This recent price jump has been made extremely known to us as its reveal was superset between the release of a game that couldn't be played and a game that nobody wanted to play. Which now leads us to a discussion. What should a $70 game really be? Or better yet, what is a triple A game that is worth such a price point? Because throughout my entire life, games have been priced at either 50 or $60. From as young as I can remember playing video games, they were like 50 bucks. But a quick Google search says that roughly around 2006, they started retailing for $60. This would have made me 11 years old or in Call of Duty release timeframe scale a year before COD 4. That's how I remember video game years is COD release dates. It's all at the top of my head right now. Ghosts 2013, Modern Warfare 2 2009, uh, Black Ops 2 2012. It just, it's all there. So that means we haven't had a general price increase for about 17 years. It's not to say there haven't been ways to get more money out of games, of course. Deluxe editions, promising in-game items going for up to $100 or more, DLCs, or as they used to say, or call it my day, expansions, and other microtransactions insulated a lot of the $60 purchases, which 
Hot take? I'm actually surprised the $70 price tag didn't come sooner. If we look at it from a pure inflation standpoint, $60 in 2006 is almost $90 today. Plus, it's not like the cost of making games has stayed the same. Games are made by people, people like you and me. And to say that their wages haven't also needed to go up to facilitate a more expensive economy would be generally incorrect. Ironically, when you look at it in relative terms, Video games have actually gone down in price over the years, staying the same cost for a while while costing more to make while not adjusting for inflation, which would make sense why there have been such an absolute abundance in microtransactions and upsells to make up the difference. So our new price point of $70 has been, has been created. And let's be real, none of us can stop it now. The precedent has been set and every major publisher is just happy that someone else did it first so they don't appear to be the boogeyman. I will go out and say, I don't mind that the new price of AAA games is $70. I was astonished it remained $60 for as long as it did. But I will say two things. One, I should not be your base metric. I, thanks to the success of this channel, the sponsors I have, streams I do, <laughs> and lovely community like yourself that shows up and watches these videos and buys merchandise at orchidate.com. <clears throat> I am doing very, very well for myself. I am not the average person. I am not the working class. So my $70 is very different than your $70. And it does me good to constantly remind myself of that. And two, the game has to be worth 70 fucking dollars. Redfall is not worth $70. Jedi Survivor on PC should not be $70. I should not have to pay $70 for a broken game with the hope it'll be fixed later. You don't pay for a car and have the dealers say, yeah, all the tires are popped and it has no windshield, but it'll be fixed at some point. When? In the future. When in the future? When will then be now? Soon. How soon? If I can make a blanket statement today, it's this. I don't give a shit if your game is $10, $40, $70. It's a fucking product. I don't sell people half a goddamn shirt. I don't care about your deadlines. Don't sell me something broken. Lick your wounds, post your cyberpunk delay image, and fix your shit before it comes out. Swallow your prime and speak to whoever ran the PC port for God of War 2018 because that game can run on my fucking Tamagotchi. Of course, I speak to the publishers more than anything. I do not fault the individual devs. I fault the unrealistic deadlines and management of those above them. Your game needs to work. Yeah? Whew. Whew. Management. Yes, management, management. Next part of the script. They are such babies. I am going to leave them in there. Management that seems to be present in the AAA industry more than most others. Those that are at fault, I refer. Because this whole thing begs another main question. What even is AAA game? <laughs> Why'd I say that that way? What even is AAA game? What is AAA? What even is a AAA game anymore? Not only what it is, but <sighs> once it's defined, is it even a sustainable concept? Like, the line between AAA game and the rest of the world's products is getting constantly blurred. For many, AAA is a standard of quality. An example of this would have been Blizzard uh, a few years back. <laughs> Blizzard games were notoriously high quality. Often their ideas weren't the first, but they were something that was really nailed down. It kind of made me have this feeling of like the Apple of video games where nothing Apple does is, is particularly brand spanking new and crazy new technology, but they, they tend to make the things they do make really polished. Overwatch 1 was a great example of this. When it came to the individual aspects of Overwatch, everything felt rather pristine. The UI was smooth and transitioned well. The character designs looked unique and the animations were crafted in a way that felt as if industry veterans were making them. Graphics too play a part in this, not photorealistic per se, but its own special feeling and art style. The game was also relatively bug free. I don't remember encountering any bugs in the launch of Overwatch. And my only real issue was the server capacity, but even then, like, I kind of get it. I still got a ton of games in regardless. We we have quality, right? Another thing to be associated with AAA is the size of the games. What are you offering? How much content is there? If we take a trip back and we think about Halo Reach, like that game was jam packed 
for what it had. A fully fledged seven to eight hour campaign that can be played normal or co-op, firefight, a co-op horde game mode, a fully fledged multiplayer with a ton of customization, maps and game modes, forge, a massive map customizer that could be a game in itself and custom games the hilarious game modes that were played from the maps you made in Forge. This was a massive game. The sheer volume of content to be played is staggering, truly staggering. So we have A, quality, B, size, and finally C, the name. And we can't pretend as if the name isn't a huge part of what makes a game AAA. Like your studio could be 40 people or 400 people, but if I slap, Activision Blizzard on it, Electronic Arts or Naughty Dog, it's going to be taken as if it's a triple A title. And this extends to people working on it. If you have Troy Baker voicing your lead, that means something. If Laura Bailey or Jennifer Hale are contracted, it assumes you have money to spend. Money smaller companies simply don't have. The industry is all names at the end of the day anyway. Right? So those are your three ABCs of AAA, quality, size, and names. The building blocks of a major AAA release video game. Or are they? Day by day, one, two, or even all three of these factors are being abandoned. It's not uncommon for a game to be missing some or all of the building blocks, yet still masquerade itself as AAA video game. Let's look at Cyberpunk when it came out, right? Size? Absolutely there. Present in all its glory. Name? 100% CD Projekt Red, well respected. Quality? <laughs> An absolute failure. A cautionary tale on the very concept of pre-ordering a title. It lives in infamy, despite the fact that it's okay now. But I didn't buy Cyberpunk for it to be okay now. Apex Legends, names? EA and Respawn. I mean, that pulls weight. Quality? Bit iffy on that one. Game constantly breaks, servers have issues often, and I've encountered my fair share of bugs and cheaters. Size? I don't think so. There are a few maps, sure, but for the most part, it's one big game mode and a couple side modes. It lacks a campaign and any co-op mode that its predecessor, Titanfall 2, had both of. Now, Apex is not a $60 game, but they shove microtransactions into you so often. The amount of horrendously expensive events that it hits you with day in and day out and still having loot boxes in 2023. Good God, even Blizzard abandoned those in Overwatch 2. Their solution isn't much better, but goddamn. And I don't, we don't even need it cover Redfall. We don't even need to cover Redfall, all right? All I had going for it was the name Arcane. The rest is an evident failure. In fact, Arcane is a question in itself. Is that considered a AAA studio? It has a AAA publisher behind it now, Bethesda, but a game like Prey, which is a, a personal favorite of mine, feels extremely AAA, but it doesn't have a big name or big size. It's entirely a product of quality. I mean, League of Legends is the biggest game in the world, and all you do is load onto the game map day in and day out, and you break your computer when Yasuo outplays you under the turrets. So this A, B, C, quality, size, and name, building blocks we've created are already falling apart. The shooter games of 2010s with the campaign multiplayer and co-op mode isn't a good metric to go by anymore. And we can't just use made by X company anymore either. I, I am a look back and I see Ghost of Tsushima and Hades, my top two games for that year. One by Sucker Punch Studios and the other by Super Giant Games. Ghost of Tsushima has all the hallmarks of being AAA. The game carries tons of talent, has a grand scale and quality to match. It is a genuine treat to play and replay, but Sucker Punch Studios is not a group that some of you might even be familiar with. For some of you, you, <laughs> I'm a 27 year old man and I'm about to break into this bit. You youngsters out there don't realize Sucker Punch Studios made the infamous games. Super underrated titles back in the Xbox 360 era. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was time. See, Sucker Punch carried a lot of weight back then, their name. Hades though, puts triple A stuff to shame. It hits all three building blocks easily with its quality, length, and name recognition. But Super Giant is a tiny ass studio. How does one call them triple A at the end of the day? Is it the price point? I would have paid $70 for Hades. The amount of hours I put in that game and the quality of it is insane. But it's made by Super Giant, teeny little studio, and it only costs dollar amounts. I don't remember how much it costs. Skater, put that right there, please. But even so, like indies in general, can do stuff better than the big names can. Like Supergiant is a constant reminder that quality is not just budget, but also talent, individual talent from devs. They're putting out games that run flawlessly and can feel like pieces of art. So many people think that 
like making a video game, being a dev is just plug and play. Like just code it this way. Just, just formulate it this way. Just balance it this way. And it's like saying, yeah, it's easy to play basketball. Just do what LeBron does. Building a game is a skill and being a dev means that you are good at that skill, but there are devs that are better at skills than others. Supergiant has accumulated this group of devs that are, while small, really fucking good at their jobs. Owlcat Games. Oh man. Pathfinder and that new Rogue Trader game that I actually got a chance to, to demo, which was really good. And I think people are going to be really happy with that one. Uh, yeah, please. If you wanted to, you'd be on these titles for genuine years with almost no reasons to put them down. Hell, I'm playing this game right now called Moonbreaker by Unknown Worlds, creators of Subnautica. It's a turn-based multiplayer game where you can control little miniatures that you can paint and fight other opponents and their lists. It's a bit Warhammer Kill Team, a bit XCOM, and a bit Mechanicus, all wrapped into one. Thing is, the voice talent they have is astounding. Over and over, I hear voices I constantly recognize, either from games like League and Overwatch or just, you know, it's all. It was Matt Mercer. Moonbreaker is an amazing game, okay? That's probably my subject for my next video, and I'm, I'm terrified. The player count right now is not very high, but oh my god, it's so good. It's so good. But going back from there, there's the question again, right? What even is a AAA game anymore? All the things that are synonymous with AAA can either be done as well or better by a smaller company, or games that used to be considered AAA are plummeting and failing at that very job. So I, I ask again for the 40th time this video, what even is a AAA game anymore? Google says it's a game with a big budget made by a name brand publisher. That's not what it used to be, but that's what it's become. AAA back then meant a type of game, a big studio game with lots of content, great quality, and name brand talent. Now it's a game with lots of money with a good studio. The entire concept of AAA, of, of AAA quality, has changed. It's in a weird way a house of cards. To be a high profile game made by a big publisher is to submit yourself to the extreme gamble because to make that, you need a high budget. And that budget isn't exclusively being used on the game. There's a great video on Casper Mattresses made by YouTuber Modern MBA. we'll link in the description, which explains the absolutely astonishing amount of money spent on advertising that direct-to-consumer companies often spend. Often a lot of the Silicon Valley venture capital people, the tech bro is like the new dollar jock at this point. They find themselves in the video game industry seeing either a quick buck or the next major thing to invest in. But investing in America isn't just about getting a little bit more money back. It's never ending increases in profits. To be profitable isn't enough. If you had 25% more profits one year, the next has to be 35. Being 15 isn't acceptable, despite the fact that you're still making money over your cost. I know I have some fans in the game industry, and I feel like even in the smaller studios, the amount of higher ups that just have a ton of money, but no idea what making a game is like is prevalent. The amount of time you are forced under horrible deadlines, terrible working conditions, and God knows what video game company culture because a whole bunch of dudes from San Francisco with a trust fund their dad gave them is now flushing full your company with capital. And now you got to do what they say. But that number has to keep going up and up and up. So $60 is one thing. Then you release a sequel every single year. Then you add microtransactions to it, loot boxes, a mobile port. You make deadlines smaller so games come out faster. And when all that fails, you fire hundreds of staff to make up the difference and up the price. All of this is not in pursuit of making really good video games. It's in pursuit of a golden goose. Why would we make Titanfall 3 when we could make a free battle royale game that has ridiculously expensive in-game events every single month and still has loot boxes in 2023? And even if, we do make a classic, lovely, single-player story game for $70. It will have a deluxe edition, and it will be broken at launch. You know, I'm not a console war person. I don't much care. But Sony still finds a way to make games that actually feel like they're worth the cost and turn a profit. God of War, both of them, mind you, are exceptions that prove a rule. They're a look into what AAA gaming used to be. No, is supposed to be. In a weird way, 
I wonder if it's a blessing. If the AAA industry is eating itself alive with unrealistic deadlines, massive CEO bonuses, and poor employee treatment, will that blend the line between indies and major publishers? I don't see high profile games sitting with overwhelmingly positive on Steam, okay? Just one. Where's everyone going? Bingo. It's Outer Wilds, Signalis, Deep Rock Galactic, Stardew Valley, and so on. Indies, or double A games, whatever you want to call them, are the ones that can be as good, if not better, than anything high profile. And all they lose is the ability for photorealistic graphics, which is no longer a selling point like it used to be. And really, what is price worth to you? You, specifically. $70, $40, $20. What are you even looking to get out of it? Like for some, it's just hours. Dollar per hour of game time, I hear some say. Now these are often those like me who are so deep in the destiny grind we forgot what sunlight is. Maybe it's narrative fulfillment, a strong story with good characters, a Witcher style game for, or a Last of Us. Competition, ranked ladders, skill ceiling, Street Fighter, CSGO, or just fun like Mario Kart or overcooked. The line between it all is being blurred. Prices fluctuate depending on game. Content fluctuates depending on intention. And AAA is really just a game by a big studio with a big marketing budget. What it really means at this point it's whatever you make of it. I'm surprised the industry has survived this long. I feel like if it wasn't for a multitude of golden geese, many wouldn't have been able to. But too big to fail is a real Thing. Balloons Tower Defense taught me that. And for each Redfall that's put out, there's something there to make the money back. I've always wanted to make a video game, you know? I, but I don't know anything about making a video game. I have ideas, concepts, but that's about it. I can't animate, rig, code, or draw. But I do have uh, two things that almost every other startup doesn't. An audience to advertise to, and capital to spend. But Often, people with capital to spend are those exact same Silicon Valley guys that seem like they have no idea what they're doing. So finding a way to not be one of those guys is a little challenging, and something I constantly worry about if I ever do want to make a video game. I may in the future, maybe. If I ever do fulfill that dream, I probably wouldn't do it with investors. I do it with Kickstarter. Owe nobody money, just have a budget, hire a crew, and do my damnedest. And hopefully I can look back at this video and say to myself, Glad I wasn't like these guys. But to be back on topic, a triple A game is something with budget and profile. And in its own right, it does not mean quality. Quality is found for prices other than $70 and by studios that aren't too big to fail. Triple A is what you and I make of it. End of story. The old definition is dead and the new one is not satisfactory. So go out, look for those overwhelmingly positive games on Steam, support your local indie devs, and, and also stop releasing broken fucking video games. Please! Come on. Obviously you're a skater.